Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here today with Rosabelle Eels. We are going to talk about her journey and her awesome management company that helps out musicians and especially um, focused on women. So I'm excited about that because as you guys know, that is a a big topic for me. Um, But before we get started, Rosabelle, I'd love to know your background and just how you came to do what you're doing today. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you for having me. Um, You know, I feel like time flies. I guess like the older I get, I'm, I'm 29, I'm turning 30 next year. And I think just like looking back at what's kind of been the last 10 years for me in music is really crazy to think that it's been 10 years, but I was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, uh, after high school, I moved to New Orleans for college. I spent two years at the university of Loyola, New Orleans. And while there, I, you know, met and started to kind of create my base circle, many of whom I still work with now. Uh, One of the people who I met while I was out there was an amazing manager named Matt Bauerschmidt, who manages an artist named g And so that was my first, you know, legit artist that I worked with and toured with and spent a lot of time kind of working in and around that camp, which then opened the door for me to work in hip hop where I spent kind of three or four years. I managed a female rapper, signed to Young Money. I did, you know, support and helped on quite a few tours in that space. And this is kind of like the very Cliff Notes version of the story. But then in, uh, you know, 2015, a very dear friend of mine, Garrett Nash, came to me because he had put out the song called I Hate You, I Love You that was just kind of spreading like wildfire and asked if I wanted to join his team and work with him. So I left the world of hip hop and started managing Garrett. And, you know, together we took that song top 10. It's now diamond in almost every country, which is crazy. I think it's now six times platinum in the US. And it was kind of like, you know, we were, I was thrown into the fire of management because there's very few ways to better learn how to be a manager than to be tasked with something as big and kind of overwhelming as that record in that time was for us. It was very special. Mm. And then off of the back of that, I started my company, which now homes seven incredible and talented and amazing writers and producers and artists. Wow. That's, that's an incredible journey. And it it seems like a lot of it was very um, serendipitous you know, things came into your path that you weren't. Definitely. No, for a long time, like when I was younger, when I was, you know, probably like 2021, I was like working in music is just really like being at the right place at the right time and like learning how to say yes to the right opportunities. And I think it still is that now I, I would like to hope I'm like a little bit more strategic, (laughs) but, um, a lot of my story in music was me just like, you know, knowing that this is what I wanted to do. And this was the environment I wanted to be in having enough common sense to see a good opportunity when it walked by and just being someone who wanted to learn and absorb and be malleable and just kind of, you know, saying yes to opportunities that felt right for me. And then using those opportunities to, to grow and learn how to be a great manager. Yeah. Did you think that management was the direction you were going to go from the beginning? I thought tour management was the direction I was going to go. Um, I found a real passion for tour management when I was first getting started. Um, 
How I explain it is that management is a never ending to-do list that you never get the satisfaction of finishing where tour management is a to-do list where at the end of every day, you get the satisfaction of finishing it. You know, and I think that there was something about the sense of completion that came with tour that I really loved, but I think my mind for business and growth was, you know, ended up being a little bit more directed in management. That makes a lot of sense. Tour management is more like project management versus like you said, just having this never ending thing of we're always trying to grow this artist in some way. And once we grew this over here, now we need to focus on this over here. You know, um, I think a lot of people that are in my audience and listen to this show, they're, they're not even clear of like what a manager does. They feel like, oh my gosh, I need one because I'm like, I am dying here. I am burnt out. I'm, you know, all that, but could you kind of explain like what really is a manager? Yeah. I mean, I think that a manager is a really hard to define role. Um, sometimes I get asked the question, like, what does your day look like on an average day? And I'm like, there is no average day. I do not have an average day, but I think a manager fundamentally is a catch all for your business, right? So a manager is somebody who is organizing, coordinating, planning, scheduling, but is also brainstorming, seeking out opportunities. Like a manager makes it so fundamentally you as an artist can, you can be as involved as you want to be. Like I have clients who are very involved in their business. I have clients who choose to just be creative, but it does open the door so you could choose to just be creative. So everything aside from creating and putting your art into the world, a manager is facilitating. Okay. Interesting. So what about things like interacting on social media and stuff that I feel like an artist really needs to do, but sometimes I don't want to do? (laughs) I mean, I think that that's really 50, 50, right? Again, like, I don't think there's a one size fits all in management. I know managers who post to clients profiles. I definitely have been a manager who has posted and, you know, um, promoted on clients profiles when they've asked me to sometimes clients choose to do that themselves again. Like it's, it's really, there's no one size fits all. You know, I think that every one of my clients have very different and specific needs, although the job is similar across the board. Mm, okay. makes sense. So more of like what your, what your specific artist really needs. Cause I know we have different business personalities, right? Some artists are really interested in the business side. Some are not some might have a lot of ideas about what that you should be doing. And some of them are like, I'm not an idea person, you know, hand that over to you. Right. Well, I think that, you know, something that someone said to me once that has really stuck with me, actually two, two things that have really stuck with me is that one, a manager should never take on a client until the client has too much going on to manage it themselves. Now I have done the opposite of that in the past. Like I have two clients on my roster who are very much developing and I'm blessed to be in a situation as a manager where I can take on projects where maybe the runway is a little bit longer, where I want to be a part of the build. Mm -hmm. But I think that often, but that is a very rare situation. I think that more times than not, you know, um, artists should not necessarily seek management until they understand what they need from a manager. I think that, you know, I'll get outreach from people sometimes who are like, I just make this amazing music. And I really feel like I need like a superstar manager to help make this happen. And, you know, the kind of scary and hard truth is that a superstar manager can't make it happen. A superstar manager can be a part of having relationships with labels or lawyers or other managers or agents or whatever, of course, but often it really is the artist that needs to do it. And so I think for me, what I look for in my clients is that they have a strong vision and understand where this is going. And what I can do is help to create the environment to which that can most flourish. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Cause a lot of times artists, just like you said, they just want to, they want someone to come in and take over because they're just so overwhelmed by everything. And that's usually not the point where they're ready. 
because they have to kind of figure themselves out first. Well, and I think the artists that are the most successful are the ones who have had to figure themselves out first. You know, I think that when you really look at artists who I, again, like are the most successful, that doesn't necessarily mean that they like climbed the ladder themselves and made it to the top, but there is a certain level of experience, knowledge, growth, understanding that they have gained themselves from whatever environment before they kind of seek a team, because at the end of the day, you know, um, then this is just more standard speaking, like management is 80, 20 for a reason, right? Like it's not a 50, 50 business. Like your manager is not your 50, 50 partner. They are there to facilitate, push through, communicate, help build for sure, come up with ideas, but it really does still sit on your shoulder to be the person who's propelling this forward. Yeah, definitely. So that 80, 20 comes up. Cause I think a lot of artists, like they don't even know, you know, what the standard yeah. situation is with a manager. Is that pretty standard? And are deals different if an artist is really still on the developing side versus at the point where they're at a place where they could actually support you at 20% as a manager? Well, I, I mean, I think managers know when they take on an artist who's developing, like what's going on, right? So a manager, in my opinion, again, like there's no one size fits all, but like normally like 15 or 20% is standard. I don't think it's appropriate for a manager to receive more than 20%. I know that sometimes managers receive less because clients have much more overhead. Like let's say you're an artist, let's say you're a bigger artist and you have an assistant, you have a security guard, you have a driver, you have a house manager, you have a staff, then maybe you need to offset some of those expenses by reducing your uh, manager's commission, but it's, it's, you know, different, but normally if we were going like standard, like business standard norm, a manager gets 20%, um, a business manager gets 5% and a lawyer gets 5%. Mm, okay. And what about a band? Like they probably would have a lot more overhead because they have more people that they have to pay. You know, um, in most band situations, they, it, it's, it's, it's fundamentally the same thing. And then the band is just splitting that like 70 or 80, depending on what it is, percent amongst the members. Mm. I've it. actually known some bands, like let's say there's four members in the band, they'll split all the profit five ways. And then one fifth of that goes into a band account. And then that band account is what's used to cover expenses and overhead outside of mm. their team. That makes sense. That's yeah. really great. So you, as a manager, when you're looking at bringing on a new client, is there, I know there's some of it that's intangible, you know, it's about their art, all that stuff, but are there any like metrics or anything that you're looking for, or is it more of an overall feel of where their career is? Yeah. I mean, I personally, I'm not like a financially or metrics based manager. Like that's not necessarily, um, what guides me. So I think that when I personally, because again, I have to keep reiterating, like I can only speak to my opinion and perspective, but like no manager is the same. Um, when I'm looking for a new client, what I really look for is above anything, do I feel like I can best serve this person? Do I feel like I can pull my weight and bring to the table what I need to bring to help move this individual forward in whatever ways they're asking? Um, so I was kind of first, like, do I think I can do it? And do I believe in the music? Do I love the music? Right. Because I, I have to love the music. I have to feel passionate about it. Like that's kind of what gets me out of bed in the morning. So let's say those two things are a yes. Then what I look for secondary to that is does this individual fit the ethos of my company? Do they fit the community that I've built? Do we have similar communication styles? do, it does it feel like we can really gel and work together? And so, and then if they say yes, then, then we start to kind of have conversations about more of like the nitty gritty and um, what that relationship would look like. But I think what I really look for is, do I feel like I can best serve them? Am I passionate about the music? And does it feel like they fit 
the ethos of what kind of overall is, because in a lot of ways, my company specifically is far more of a community than it is a company. Like all of my clients have relationships with each other. They all work together. We all support each other. If there's a win for one, it's a win for the whole team. And so when I bring someone in, it really is like, does this person feel like they can join this family and they can both benefit and also help to propel the community? Yeah, I definitely want to talk about your company ethos and your community. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask like on your side, what skills do you think you had to develop as a manager to be able to do what you do? And when you said like the ones I can best serve, like what are the skills that you think, like what are your superpowers as a manager? Um, I think my superpowers as a manager are my organization skills. I have an incredible intuition. Everything I've ever done has been guided by my intuition. Um, So I think it'd be like my organization skills, my communication skills, my intuition, and my just like overall understanding of business and how to make money. (laughs) And how to good thing. Yeah, and how to make something profitable. But I think that really like my superpower is my compassion, my empathy, the love that I bring to the table. Like you know, I feel like I serve a specific clientele that really likes that and needs that and enjoys that support. I think there are other clients that are like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I just want you to like, make this happen. And like, I don't necessarily need the, the compassion and the love and the, the, the kindness, Mm. but that's something that, you know, I, I take a lot of pride in and love to, to share with my clients. That's awesome. And obviously that ties into your company ethos and your mission and all that. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, just something that I've been saying for the past 10 years that kind of ended up becoming the company ethos is that we really are good people fighting for the good people. And I take a lot of pride with that. You know, I, um, I was chatting with a friend recently who had left music and has kind of gone into other uh, entrepreneurial efforts and keeping a toe in music, but it's kind of exiting out. And I was telling them, or they were telling me all the reasons why they didn't want to be in music anymore, how it was the toxic environment. It was the negative conversations. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was all the toxicity and I couldn't help, but while I was sitting there listening to them, think to myself, like, well, I don't deal with any of that. Like I don't, right. Because I really go out of my way to be like, I only do business with good people. I'm a good person. I surround myself with good people. I try to bring love and grace and joy to everything that I do. And I think because of that, I take a lot of pride in, in this, this business. But within that, I seek similar individuals to be my employees and to surround ourselves with, you know? And I've always said, like, I said this years ago, like as a manager, I was only going to go as far as being a good person could take me. And if at some point I hit a wall where I felt like I had to start to compromise my morals or behave in a way that didn't feel authentic to me, then I was going to dip. Like I wasn't interested and I have done nothing but continue to propel upwards. So, Mm -hmm. you know, our ethos is that we are genuinely just good people that are just out here being good people (laughs) every day. And I love that you're, you know, you're really putting that forward and and sticking to that because in that way, you're going to attract the, only the artists that really want that, not the artists that are just only focused on the money and they're willing to like step on everyone to get there, you know? Well, that's the thing is like, I, and like, look, of course, in any friendship relationship, business relationship, whatever you have ups and downs, you have bumps, but it's like, I don't have conflict with my employees. I don't have conflict with my clients. We don't have conflict with each other because I think we're all kind of just on the same page, right? Like I've managed to now build an environment of people who their personal ethos kind of all just line up. And so then when I'm dealing with people outside of my company, other managers, publishers, label a whatever, I think because that's what my company exudes, we find ourselves also only really dealing with like other good people, you know? And I think that like, it's so interesting because you'll sometimes hear the feedback about how like the music industry kind of breeds like shittiness or that people experience like this toxicity and like, look, yes, 100%. Like I'm not out here saying for the last 10 years, it's been rainbows and butterflies, but I will say that as I really started to put this mindset forward and be like, this is how I can stay in this industry. Like for me to stay here, I have to surround myself in these healthy environments. Then you just realize how many other people are out there in this industry with that same perspective. And those are the people who you really are starting to grow and build and collaborate with. 
Yeah, no, I so agree. We can take back the industry, kill yeah. it, you know, kill them with kindness. I mean, that's, how, I mean, that's really how I feel, right? Like really truly is that I'm just, and, and, and again, like, I'm not trying to pretend like it's all butterflies and rainbows. Like, of course shit comes up, right? Like not every day is like, and, and it's not easy right? Being a manager is not easy. Running a company is not easy. Like being in music, especially post pandemic, like the, the, none of this is easy, but I think that like, that's okay. It's when it's not easy and toxic that you're just like, Ooh, I can't handle that. So by like elevating yourself out of environments that could potentially be negative or toxic and surrounding yourself with like real genuine, like positivity, collaboration, friendship, compassion, it kind of makes it all just like bearable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I'm thinking about the artists on your roster. I know you're, you attract the kind of people that would be supportive of each other, but do you ever experience them maybe getting competitive with each other. I know artists are so easily comparing themselves to others, you know? No, that's awesome. Not, not, not on my roster. Yes. Like comparison fatigue is a really big thing. You know, uh, the statement like comparison is the thief of joy is a very real statement. And I do witness my clients struggle with comparison fatigue or not understanding why things happen for other people that aren't happening for them because the timeline is so different. I mean, like, you know, and, and I see that, but that does not happen internally. We really, and and I think something else is that we don't have any clients to sit in the same, although it's all kind of housed under the concept of alternative pop. None of my clients sit in the exact same space. That helps. That definitely. 100%. So I don't have like two Nashes or two Ahmad Broyles, you know, or to like every, everybody sits in their own space so that they can actually genuinely just support each other. Yeah. That, that, that makes a lot of sense on your roster. So I had a few questions about kind of what you do with your clients. So are you seeking like label support for them or are they mostly doing, you know, independent releases? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. Overall is um, launching a label later this year with um, a major label partner. We're doing a JV. The deal's not signed yet, so I can't like talk about it, but um, mostly because I just try not to talk about things until like, you know, don't, don't, don't cut your chicken until they hatch. But that's so right. I, so I am doing a JV with a major label to be able to give opportunity both to my client and other talent that I, you know, find and believe in to be able to release to me if that's what they want. But aside from that, um, it's really 50, 50, you know, Nash is signed to Atlantic, Ahmad who still has an artist project is independent, but we're working on something new that we might shop around to a label. Uh, Elon is independent. Girl wild is in a label deal with a label called snafu. Max is independent. Joe Rico just signed to Atlantic. And then our newest client, Sean Kennedy is independent. So it's just really 50, 50. Hmm. Interesting. And do you like, if you're looking to take on an artist, do they, do you feel like they absolutely have to tour? Or do you think nowadays, if they don't want to tour, they can still have you know, a career that way? I think that you ask a really interesting question and something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, recently, which is that, you know, my biggest touring act would be Nash. He tours a lot. We spent five years basically on tour nonstop all over the world. You name it. We were there kicking ass, selling out shows, the whole nine. And then COVID hit. And then he really didn't see like, a loss of income. Mm. And he was like, wait, what? (laughs) And because he wasn't on tour, he was able to make music, but what, what he didn't realize was that a lot of the music that he was making was actually music that he was making with playing live shows in mind. Right. So he was thinking to himself like, oh, this will be perfect for this or whatever. So he took touring out and he just made the most incredible body of work imaginable. Like I am so blown away by what he's made, but now that has opened the conversation for us about what touring looks like for him. Right. And I think my, I don't know if I have like a settled opinion on this, but I think in the circumstance of him, cause that's all I can really speak to is that he will tour. He probably won't tour as much and that's totally okay. I think that some acts 
are really heavily touring based acts. And that is a big part portion of how they see their fans, how they make their money, whatever. Some artists are streaming, some artists are both. And I think that like, yes, when you are a new artist coming out the gate to make fans, to build those connections, I do think touring is important. But I think that there's also a world where like, it's actually to me, like, it's really about like, well, what do you want? right? Like, what do you want as an artist? Like, if what you want is you want the tours, you want the merch, you want the streams, like you want all of it, then you have to do all of it, right? But if as an artist, you're like, hey, I'm super happy with how I stream and sell online. And like, I'll do a few shows here and there. But like, I'm actually super content with this. That's also okay, too. So I think it's really like, I don't, I I don't know if there's like a format. And that's something that I, I, realized over COVID because I definitely was also indoctrinated with the idea that like the only way to make it work is to be on the road. Especially being a touring manager previously. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So yeah, I think there are those artists out there, especially they've realized as they slowed down during COVID, wow, there's all these parts of life that I was missing out on and stuff. And maybe they don't want to tour. So in Nash's example, how was he making money then when he stopped touring? Um, through many revenues, uh, through merchandise. He owns uh, a portion of his catalog independently. Mm. So that does well. Um, features, just uh, d- different different ventures completely outside of music. I, you know, and I think that it's, often with touring, you know, you spend a lot of money to tour, right? Like you put a lot of money in touring. And I think that that was the big realization for him was that he was like, so after you actually look at your bottom line of what you've made, he was like, I think that there's just other ways that I could be doing this as well. So that being said, he is still going to go out, but I think like, you know, and obviously he's like the ultimate, but Frank Ocean is an amazing example of this, right? Like Frank Ocean doesn't really tour. And when he does a show, like his fans show out, but that's just not something that seems to be of interest to him. And I think that like, but Frank Ocean is still one of the biggest and the best ever to do it, you know? So I think that like, it's really about just like creating the environment that makes sense for you. Yeah. That's but my true. agents would probably hate me for saying that. So like, <laughs> if my agents hear this, Disclaimer. tour, 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 lots of touring. <laughs> well, and were, are they also kind of pursuing the sync options? Yeah. I mean, sync, I think is a really complicated and like weird beast because you can't really control sync. Sync is like kind of something that comes to you. So, you know, Ahmad did four songs on the Birds of Prey soundtrack, including the Doja Cat Boss Bitch record and the theme song. Um, And that was an amazing sync opportunity. He then had a song in the Space Jam film that came out. Like he's, you know, always kind of working on stuff like that, but I, I don't, know if you can really chase sync as much as you can make stuff and then hope that it gets sunk. (laughs) Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's a nice income stream, but you, like you said, you can't absolutely count on it. Yeah. Necessarily. Cool. Um, let's see, I think I have one more question. Um, and that is, you know, there's a lot of indie artists listening to this podcast or watching this video and when, you know, how should they know if it's time for them to pursue a manager? And I know you said like when they're too busy, but they might perceive that differently. They may be like, well, yeah, I'm too busy because I, I need to build my website. I need, you know, like I need to do all these totally. basic things I haven't done yet. Well, so I think that it depends what type of manager you're talking about, right? Like when I started managing Nash, although I had been in music for many years, I had never experienced something as big as I hate you, I love you. He really, Garrett was my friend. Garrett was my best friend. And we really like figured it out. So I think the first thing too, is that like, you don't have to, like, I, I sometimes think that homie managers, like friend managers end up being the best managers that you can have. Right. So I think that like, that's like one angle of this conversation. They're so invested. Right. Yeah. And also like y'all figure it out together. That's what, that's my biggest lesson is like, I didn't graduate college. I don't come from like music nepotism, you know, like I, I, I wasn't raised in LA. Like I literally grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I figured this out for myself. And I think that like the biggest lesson from that is that like, if you're an artist and you feel overwhelmed, but you don't necessarily feel like you're so big that you need to go seek like established management, like find a homie 
who has like a little bit of a mind for business and like y'all can figure it out together. Like I think, and, and you'll probably be like far more successful than, than you would think. So I think that's like the first thing, right? Is that like finding a manager, building a team, like I don't want to deter people by thinking that they have to be an island and they have to do it on their own. I more speak to when you start to seek out, like you're like, oh, this person is my favorite artist who is their manager. I want to work with that person. That's when you start to be like, you know, when you seek out more of a management company situation, then yeah, you should probably have a certain level of momentum, interest, um, things are moving. Maybe you're starting to get hit up by ARs. Maybe, you know, you've um, been playing shows and you've been touring yourself and you've actually built like a little bit of like a, like a touring base for yourself where you're like, Hmm, this is really starting to feel like something. I think that like when you shouldn't seek out a manager or management companies, when you feel stuck and you're like, mm-hmm. Oh, if I find a manager, this person will out stick me like that doesn't work, right? You should seek out a a manager, a management company or a situation when you're like, no, 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 like this really feels like this is moving. And if I could pull somebody in, we could really maybe do something with this. I think that that's a good time. But that being said, tap in your friends, tap in the people around you who love you. You know what I mean? Like you had a friend that makes dope shit on Photoshop, like have them design your artwork, have them make a t-shirt for you. Like Squarespace is an incredibly easy platform to build a website. Like, you know, put something good on TV and mess around with it until you build something for yourself that you like. Like, I think, especially in the last five to 10 years, so many of things to become successful, these tools were like, previously they were coveted, right? It was very like, I heard a statistic, don't quote me, um, you know, but it's something along these lines where, it was like 10 years ago, there was a total of about uh, 60,000 songs coming out a year, between like 40 and 60,000 songs coming out a year. Now, there's between 40 and 60 songs coming out every single day. I believe it. That's but nice. what that means is that those tools have now been given to you, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to get a record deal to get your to get your music out. Like we have the tune cores and the distro kids and the stems and the levels and all of these places that you can be uploading your music and they can be helping you with like playlisting opportunities, right? We have these incredible resources like TikTok that you can be like putting your art out there and building a fan base for yourself. You have like all of these things. And so I think that like you should be doing those things. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing all of those things and it feels like things are really starting to spike and you're like, I need to talk to someone. I need someone who can guide me. That's a good time to start looking for a manager. Oh, that was so awesome. I mean, I I feel like, first of all, there's a bunch of people that take my courses that are like what you said. They're like, I'm this person's mom or I'm this person's friend you know, I'm helping them, I'm managing them, or I'm doing this together with them. And they're just getting educated. And there's so many ways to get educated. Now there's so many tools. I think you're absolutely right. And I love the way that you kind of drew that visual of like, don't go looking for a manager when you're stuck. You got to get yourself out of the mud first. And then when you like start driving down the road, cause you got out of the mud and you want to go faster, you get other people to come and push you, you know, <laughs> or throw the, you know, more gas in the vehicle so you can go faster or whatever. Exactly. And I think that, you know, I have a lot of empathy, right? Like even for my bigger clients, I get it. There is so much noise and trying to cut through the noise and get your art out there. And, and it's, it's, it's hard and it's complicated, but I think the biggest thing is that like, everybody's feeling that Mm -hmm. the biggest artists that you could only imagine are feeling that down to the person who's just starting. Like we're in a really unprecedented time with the amount of just pure media that is constantly being out, put out all the time and trying to catch that moment get that momentum. And I think that, you know, in every generation of music, artists, managers, whoever, like everybody had frustrations, right? Like it was trying to get your CDs to the radio station or the local record store to play it. Or, you know, it's like everybody's had their things. And right now are things that we have so much. Mm -hmm. And I think that understanding that like nobody's figured it out 
Like no one's figured out how to just cut through the noise and have a massive hit. But the first song you put out, like no one's figured that out. Right. And so because of that, all you can do is just be putting your art out in an authentic, dope, unique way, surrounding yourself with people who support you, making sure you have an amazing brain trust and just try to keep pushing it forward. I think it's so helpful to hear that from someone like you that's in it, that no one's figured it out. Like, I think as an artist, you're in this island of like thinking that you're the only one that like doesn't know the secret or something, you know? Totally. Oh gosh. Well, we have covered so much and I know this has been so helpful for everyone. Is there anything else that you want to make sure to cover while we're here today that might help our Mm -hmm. audience? No, I think other than my, my things is you can't put out too much music. Mm. Don't be too precious with it. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You're going to be fine. Love it. Those, yeah, those are awesome. Sometimes they, you know, they clutch onto their song thinking it's like, if I only I had the right way to release it, it's going to be the biggest thing in the world. No, just, just get it out there. (laughs) Just get it out there, you know, and, and it's the, it's fine. Get it out there. Be adventurous. The cool thing too, is you can always take stuff down. So if you do it, you don't like it, take it down, do it again. I don't know. Like, I think that like, there's not a formula. So you got to just try, you got to just try and see what works. Like it's it, trial by error in so many ways is the only way to truly figure it out. Mm. I love hearing that from someone who is a manager. <laughs> Cause I feel like, you know, we as indie artists might think that managers know all the, you know, all the steps and the secrets and the, the things that we don't know, and they've got it all figured out. And obviously you have been through this. You have done the failures you've tested, you tried, that's how you got where you are now. And I think that's inspiring to everybody listening because they can do that too. Great. Right. I love it. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? Okay. Well, how can our listeners find you? I know they're going to want to learn more about you and more about the artists on your roster. We're online at overallmanagement.com. We're on Instagram at overall management. You know, we're, we're there. We're very easy to find. Awesome. Seek them out. You guys overall management. Thank you so much, Rosabelle. This has been a really, really great conversation. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.